Hello, my name is Che Hong Chen. I am a senior scientist at the Stanford University School of Medicine. I work in the Department of Chemical and the System Biology. So today I would like to share with you a topic titled alcohol intolerance and the using genetic epidemiology for precision cancer prevention. And uh, before I talk, I also like to mention that I'm an inventor of several patterns at Stanford to correct the, the ALDS2 deficiency. So just to say that upfront. However, none of my research or my talk today actually is funded by industry or related to the pattern that I fired through Stanford University. So I'd like to first tell you what is alcohol intolerance and why this is important subject in the context of alcohol drinking and the cancer. And I will divide my talk into four parts. First, I will explain to you what is alcohol intolerance and the interesting genetic variation, especially among the East Asians, that they have a very different alcohol metabolism and how did that affect our health. That's the second part of my talk, and I'm going to describe how prevalent these genetic variations as are among the East Asians or even worldwide, and why that is important in relationship to our health or disease. And the third part of what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use alcohol intolerance as example and incorporating the genetic data that we have learned in oral and esophageal cancer prevention, because these two types of cancers are most closely related to alcohol intolerance and alcohol drinking. And lastly, I'm going to use an example in Taiwan, which I'm quite heavily involved in trying to educate people about alcohol intolerance, and because this is an important public health issue in the context of cancer. So first, I would like to introduce to you what is alcohol intolerance. And it also goes by different names. Some people call it alcohol flushing. More specifically, some people call it Asian alcohol flushing. And, and there's a reason why people call it Asian alcohol flushing, because most people, if you are Asian or you have friends who are Asian descendants, you notice that when they drink alcohol, many of them will have a a flushing face right away, as shown in the picture here. On the left, it's a person from Japan before alcohol drinking. And then just by a glass of beer uh, after alcohol drinking, you can see his face turns red. Not only that, this flushing also associated with a headache. And also people experience that. Uh, I myself is one of them. I have alcohol intolerance when I drink alcohol. Very quickly, you will not only flush, you will also have a headache. And simultaneously, you will have experienced a rapid heart rate, heart beating, that's called palpitation. And if you drink a little bit more, you will vomit and also a hangover. These are all symptoms associated with alcohol flushing. And so I'm going to tell you how this is so important because alcohol intolerance, I'm going to use the term alcohol intolerance throughout my talk, because alcohol intolerance really affects many, many people in the world. It is calculated that 560 million people or 80% of the world population have alcohol intolerance. And the majority of them are East Asians as shown on the map here. You can see that the reason is because the origin of this alcohol intolerance is caused by a single point mutation. And it happened based on haplotype and evolutionary study. It happened about 3000 years ago in this area, that is southeastern part of China. About 3000 years ago, one single person, probably through random mutation, passed this gene on to now 560 million people worldwide. And as you can see that they are all distributed in East Asian countries. Shown here, for example, in China, there's about 35% of the people have this mutation all descended from this single founder 3000 years ago. It affects also Korea, Japan, Taiwan, 
as you can see that it's the highest, it's 49% of the people carry this mutation. And I will show you a little bit more data from Taiwan. And even effects spread out to the Southeast Asia in countries like Vietnam, about 15% of the people carry this variant. And in Singapore also very high because it's highly Han Chinese population. Even in the United States, we know there are many Asian descendants. We estimate that there are at least 15 million people of Asian Americans are affected by this mutation. And the mutation is called the E504K because it has a single amino acid substitution caused by one single base pair mutation and change the glutamic acid 504 position to a lysine. And the SNP ID is called RS671. So this mutation is very well defined. Now, alcohol metabolism actually is very simple in human body. In the human genome, we actually have seven alcohol dehydrogenase gene that can metabolize alcohol into acetaldehyde. And from acetaldehyde in the genome human, we have 19 aldehyde dehydrogenase genes as shown here that can metabolize all kinds of aldehyde into acids, and that's non-toxic. And here I'm shown here the majority of the alcohol in our body actually is converted in the gut, liver, and the small intestine. 90% of the alcohol is metabolized through this pathway of alcohol dehydrogenase and aldehyde dehydrogenase. Not only that, there are two major enzymes actually metabolize the majority of alcohol in acetaldehyde. As you can see here, it is the ADH1B enzyme that is most efficient in converting alcohol into acetaldehyde. And then it is the ALDH2 isozyme that has the highest affinity or low KM for the substrate of acetaldehyde that can metabolize acetaldehyde into the non-toxic acetic acid. Importantly, we know that alcohol causes addiction. Alcohol also has a high energy content, about seven kilocal per grams of alcohol. Uh, it generates a lot of energy, but to the health risk, actually more seriously and more toxic is the compound acetaldehyde because it's very reactive. It binds to protein, binds to DNA and can cause mutation. And therefore acetaldehyde has been classify as a group one carcinogen by WHO, the, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Since 1980s, this compound has been classified as a group one carcinogen because it's highly associated with cancer in human. So the problem of alcohol intolerance is because of this. As you can see in the normal subject, that alcohol metabolism has no problem if you carry a normal ADH1B enzyme and a normal aldehyde dehydrogenase 2 enzyme, you have no problem of metabolizing alcohol easily to acetaldehyde and acetic acid. You will not accumulate this group one carcinogen. However, in those East Asians who have alcohol flushing, they carry a mutation in the ALDH2 gene, as I mentioned, this is a single point mutation. The allele in the literature, it's a nomenclature as ALDH2 star to allele. And also I mentioned that the SNP ID is R61 and amino acid change is E504K. This single point mutation renders ALDH2 inactive. The enzyme has very, very low activity or almost no activity, therefore, Subjects with this mutation, when they drink alcohol, acetaldehyde can easily accumulate it here and affects your health. And you can see that it's accumulation of acetaldehyde that caused the alcohol flushing. Also, we call that now these people are alcohol intolerant because they cannot metabolize the pathway of alcohol properly. And because of the accumulation of acetaldehyde, it causes mutation and the acetaldehyde is also highly toxic. So it's actually very damaging to the cells. That's why there are many diseases now being shown to be associated with 
acetaldehyde accumulation. In fact, many of the alcohol-induced diseases or organ damage are probably all caused by acetaldehyde rather than alcohol. And most prominently today, I'm going to talk about cancer and maybe a little bit about cardiovascular disease. The interesting thing about this mutation is that in the East Asians, the people not only have problem metabolizing acetaldehyde because of AODS mutation, but in the East Asian population, there's also a very common polymorphism in the ADH1B gene. This mutation in most Asians actually make ADH1B much active. It's almost 80 times more active than the regular ADH1B compared to the Caucasians. In other words, in more than 80% of the East Asians, they have a super active aldehyde dehydrogenase 1B enzyme that can convert very, very fast from alcohol to acetaldehyde. And then 30, 40% of the people cannot metabolize acetaldehyde. And as you can see that this really compounds the problem when these people drink alcohol. That is that they will have a rapid metabolism of alcohol to acetaldehyde, and they cannot get rid of acetaldehyde properly. And so this is now called alcohol intolerance. And I also try to make this more aware to the Asian population. So I put it here, the Chinese and also the Japanese and Korean translation for alcohol intolerance, just for people who are interested in this. Okay, so I'm going to use Taiwan as an example to see how genetic epidemiology is useful in terms of future cancer prevention. Here, a table shows that, as I mentioned, that there's a polymorphism in the ADH1B gene, and also there's a polymorphism in the ALDH2 genes. People can carry either the H allele, which is the fast metabolizing alcohol allele, or they carry the K allele, which is the deficient ALDH2 allele. So here are basically four phenotypes that you can observe in the population in Asian countries, such as Taiwan. For example, in terms of alcohol metabolism, you can classify people into either they are fast alcohol metabolizer or slow alcohol metabolizer, depending on whether they carry the ADH1B, the H allele, or the R allele. Since the H allele is dominant, so here the RH and the HH genotype would have the same phenotype. So you can see that if you carry this combination of ADH1B and ALDH2 here, ALDH2 will affect the acetaldehyde metabolism. You can be either normal acetaldehyde metabolizer or you can be the deficient metabolizer. And we call it fast and slow acetaldehyde metabolism. So you can have four different types of combination, as you can see. And here, depending on ALDH2, actually is the determinant. I'm sorry, there's a type O, it's ALDH2. It's, you, you will have a flashing reaction or not, depending on the ALDH2 status. So here you can see in Taiwan that we calculated people who have alcohol intolerance would have at least here 45.6% and the 3.4%, and that add together to 49% of the population. In other words, in this country, almost half of the population are alcohol intolerant. And this is very important because these people are very susceptible to acetaldehyde toxicity. In other words, they are very vulnerable to cancer caused by alcohol drinking. And here is a study done also in Taiwan, published in the 2009, using volunteers to show that even a very moderate amount of alcohol drinking, it's already very dangerous for people who are alcohol intolerant. And here uh, on the left, there are 13 volunteers given a dose of alcohol. This is a very moderate amount of alcohol, about two cans of beer. That's considered moderate drinking or 0.5 gram per kilogram body weight of alcohol challenge. You can see that very quickly after 20 minutes of alcohol drinking, the blood acetaldehyde level increased very rapidly in people who are genotyped as ALDH2 star two. The blue line are the people who carry the normal ALDH2 gene. That means they have functional normal aldehyde dehydrogenase enzyme 
they can metabolize acetaldehyde normally, therefore they don't accumulate. You cannot detect any acetaldehyde level in the blood for this dose of alcohol. Now you can see that for ALDS deficient subjects, their acetaldehyde level rise very high, almost already above the carcinogenic level. And concomitantly, you can see that their heart rate will also increase rapidly. And this is due to the effect of acetaldehyde because it is known that acetaldehyde will cause tachycardia. So they will also have a rapid increase. So this shows that this is very sensitive for people who are actually alcohol intolerant. On the right, showing that's even more dangerous if you drink alcohol and also smoke a cigarette at the same time, because it is also known that tobacco, when it's burnt, it produces a high level of also acetaldehyde, and that is dissolved in the saliva. So in this study done, I believe in Finland, subjects were given three cans of beer, a little bit higher dose because they were Caucasian, 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight of alcohol challenge. And then at the same time, we're asked to smoke a cigarette every 20 minutes. And as you can see here, the time scale that every 20 minutes when they drink the white dotted line, just alcohol alone, the black dotted line is when you drink alcohol and smoke at the same time. As you can see that every 20 minutes, there's a big spike of saliva acetaldehyde level to about 300 and 400 micromolar. As you compare to the scale on the left, here the blood level is only about 60, 70 micromolar. Here it's more than 300 micromolar. So as you can imagine that if you drink and if you smoke at the same time, and if you also have LDH2 efficiency, your level of acetaldehyde in both blood and the saliva will be extremely dangerous. Now, you may think that this is only an Asian-specific problem. As I mentioned that there was this mutation originated from 3,000 years ago in Southeast China. But now we know there are actually many other type of ALDH2 mutation that may also affect ALDH2 enzyme activity. And the phenotype will be the same. As shown here that if you search Google, there's a lot of people who are not East Asians, but mention that they also have alcohol flushing syndrome. As example here, you can actually go to this YouTube, this volunteer, I believe his name is Bamon. Perhaps a Latino, he mentioned that he has a very severe alcohol flushing after three cans of beer drinking. And here we published a paper just at the end of last year. We actually map now, in addition to this very common ALDH2 star 2 mutation, there are seven, eight other major point mutations that occur at a fairly high frequency in other ethnic groups. For example, here we have a mutation that changed proline 92 to threonine. We now name it ALDH2 star 5 allele. That occurs in 2.5% of the Latinos. And here's another mutation the V287M, also very high prevalence in the Latinos, 2.4%. But not just that, you can see that even in Finnish, there's a, a mutation that affects more than one per 100 persons. And we actually characterize these enzymes in vitro and knowing that they also have various degrees of lower ALDH activity. In other words, we really predict that people other than East Asians, if they carry any of these variant alleles of ALDH2, they probably would have a similar phenotype of alcohol flushing. And so there's probably now we calculated maybe at least additional 120 million non-East Asians may be ALDH2 deficient on top of the 560 million people that we already know. And so this is very important because we now have done a lot of literature search and know that the acetaldehyde toxicity may cause many different types of diseases. Here I'm showing that there are many, many diseases in the literature has been reported being associated with ALDH2 mutation, ranging from CNS disease to diabetes, osteoporosis, gout, 
and even rare disease such as uh, Franconi anemia. But today I'm going to focus on just uh, upper aerial digestive tract cancer called uh, UADT cancer. That is namely the head, neck, region, oral, and the upper GI, namely the esophagus and the hyperpharyngea and, and larynx. And I will mention now first about stroke and the cardiovascular disease, why this is relevant to alcohol intolerance. Now, we all know that the NIH has been posting the uh, amount of alcohol drinking and defined a moderate drinking as two drinks per day for men and one drink per day for women. And here, the NIAAA, we defined 14 grams of alcohol as one standard drink. So two drinks I calculated here for you, it's 20 gram per day for men or 196 gram per week for men. And this is very important to quantify because as you can see that in the middle, there's a recent paper published in Lancet using a large study of 500 men and women in China, genotyping their AODH2. In the past, people used to think that moderate alcohol drinking is cardioprotective. There seems to be a J-shaped curve that a little bit of alcohol seems to be cardioprotective as shown in here, also protecting against a stroke. So this is ischemic stroke and also the hemorrhagic stroke here. You can see that there's a dip with a moderate amount of this alcohol. It seems to be protective. However, more thorough genetic study, it's been published now. It's shown that this effect actually is not causal. It's probably due to analytical error or bias. As you can see here now, through this 500,000 subject study, there's actually a no J-shaped effect of alcohol protection. The damage of alcohol now is shown to be actually quite linear. That it means that there's a dose dependence of damage as shown here in stroke. And it is also true for cardiovascular disease, except probably the only exception is still a myocardial infection. There's a small protection. So the important message to give out here is that moderate alcohol drinking is no longer safe for cardio protection or for protection against stroke. Another study published in Lancet 2018, also now showing that the risk threshold for alcohol consumption is actually quite low. Rather than close to 200 grams per week, it is shown that even around 100 grams per week, it's already a health risk for people. And it doesn't matter whether you are Caucasian or whether you are East Asian. And here is calculate that if you drink this amount of alcohol, there's a shortening of life expectancy about six months. And this is moderate amount of drinking, about 300 gram to 360 gram. This is considered moderate drinking. If you drink this dose, actually there's a life span shortening of between one to two years. And if you drink more, of course, there's a loss of life, even a longer period. Therefore, the message I would like to give out here is that moderate alcohol drinking, it's probably not safe. And we actually should probably start to think about lowering the alcohol drinking guidelines, especially for individuals with alcohol intolerance, since it affects such a large population in the world. And here is it's esophageal cancer. I'm not going to focus on the esophageal cancer and oral cancer. Here, as you can see that esophageal cancer incidence is highest in the world in East Asia. And in East Asia, the esophageal cancer is also very unique because most of the esophageal cancer is the type called the esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. It's very different from the Caucasians who have esophageal cancer because these people are namely the lower GI uh, esophageal cancer, and it's uh, classified, uh, the pathology is different, it's adenocarcinoma versus the East Asian, they are mainly in the upper GI region because it's really associated with alcohol drinking. And so this is not only a cancer that is depending on the genotype, but also it's very influenced by the lifestyle factors. Here you can see that the esophageal cancer or head neck cancer, actually there's a very good overlap, not exactly the same. Between here, you can see on the left, head neck cancer incidence in the world. You know, the blue darker ones are the high incident area. 
and also the amount of alcohol consumption in different regions of the world. You can see that there's a quite good overlap in areas where higher alcohol consumption, there's also a higher incidence of head neck cancer and the same for esophageal cancer. Here's a published meta-analysis. You can see that the esophageal cancer risk is very, very high. If you carry the AODH2 mutation and if you drink alcohol, then the more you drink, the more dangerous here. You can see that this is a dose of one drink per day, two drink per day, and three drink per day, and the risk of esophageal cancer. The blue line is the people who do not flush. Yes, they do have increased esophageal cancer, but not as great as the people who are alcohol flushers. You can see that if you drink average of three drinks per day, your odds ratio is already more than 70 times higher. And now I'm going to use oral cancer and esophageal cancer in Taiwan as an example of how we can actually use this knowledge to integrate in the prevention of oral cancer and screening. Here showing again the Taiwan as a East Asian country that two of the most common cancers in men are related to AODH2 deficiency and alcohol drinking. That is number four, oral cancer, and number six, esophageal cancer in men. These two cancers are very specific related to gender because men drink a lot more. So the men to female ratio is about 15 to one for these two types of cancers. The medium age of cancer is very, very young compared to most of the cancer, the medium age is about 65. These two cancers, uh, the medium age of cancer incidence is very young at 55 years old. In fact, Taiwan, in the young men, the number one cancer is oral cancer in Taiwan. And these two types of cancer are, as I mentioned, highly associated with alcohol drinking and smoking. And in Taiwan, very uniquely, because a lot of people also chew the betel nut, it contains also another type of carcinogen. Therefore, the incidence of oral cancer and esophageal cancer is very high, many among people who have ALDS2 mutation and also have the alcohol smoking and betel nut use. Importantly, these are actually preventable. Even if you carry the mutation, if you avoid alcohol smoking and betel nut tubing, this is very highly preventable. So Taiwanese government has been very active. They knew this risk factors for the past 20, 30 years. And they have been offering free screening for oral examination for anyone who smoke and anyone who chew betel nut. But even with this very strong initiative, as you can see that oral cancer continued to rise over the last 20, 30 years, it has increased about sevenfold the prevalence. And the death rate continues right too. It increased about four or five folds the death rate, even with very strong government investment in education. And as you can see that the betel nut user has been decreased from 17% to 8.4% in Taiwan. And same goes for the smoking population. It has decreased from 40% to 26% in male. However, you can see that the oral cancer incidence and death rate continues to rise. And you can maybe attribute to the increased heavy alcohol drinking. Now you can see that over the past 20, 30 years, the heavy drinkers in, in Taiwan, and I think it's true probably in majority of the East Asian countries, alcohol and consumption has increased very, very rapidly as compared to the United States or Europe. The heavy alcohol drinking population has now increased from 3% to 37%. And so this is the four risk factors I mentioned. That's known. Now we call the ABCD risk factor for upper aero digestive tract cancer or oral cancer, esophageal cancer. A stands for alcohol, B, betel nut, C, cigarette, a D for deficiency in ALDH2. As you can see that Taiwanese government in the oral prevention program and screening, they only emphasize two of the four risk factors. They only tell people who chew betel nut and those who smoke and 35 years old to come for biannual free oral examination. In other words, you can see that out of the four risk factors, they only captured two of the risk. And shown here, you can see that 
This is the odds ratio of oral cancer in Taiwan. One single risk factor, double risk factor, triple risk factor, and quadruple risk factors. You can see that the odds ratio of oral cancer increase very, very dramatically from 10 folds to 400 folds compared if you only drink or if you drink and smoke and chew betel nut and also have the AODS2 variant genotype. In other words, so this program, it's been done for 20 years. It's successful to a degree, but really not completely because they only capture two of the high risk behaviors and they didn't include the genetic information in their screening. So what we are doing now and promoting in Taiwan is to initiate pilot study to also include the alcohol use and also the genotype of ALDS2 in consideration of a comprehensive oral cancer screening and prevention educational program. And so we will now include both genetic risk factor of ALDS deficiency or alcohol intolerance and, and then these three high risk lifestyle and behavioral risk factors into the program of oral cancer prevention. And this has been tried actually, we will try this in this model, it's more like a precision medicine. In the past, as you can see that the model is to just screen for people who smoke and have betel nut use. And this B and C factor, they provide a free screening every two years. Now, what we are trying to propose is that we should increase heavy drinkers in this screening program and perhaps increase the screening frequency to the oral exam from every two years to once a year. Furthermore, we would like to also include the ALDS2 uh, deficiency genotype into this program and identify people who are extremely high risk group. In other words, people who have the ABCD risk factors and maybe propose that we will follow them more extensively by providing oral exam every six months. So combining with genetic data and questionnaire, I think we can really implement a more precision medicine-based oral cancer and screening program, and we think it should be more effective in reducing the oral cancer burden in Taiwan. This has been actually tried in Japan for esophageal cancer screening. As you can see that a published study using a single hospital pilot study there's a new way of a risk assessment by including alcohol flushing and alcohol consumption data and assigning them different risk score. Example here, for example, if you have alcohol flushing, you will have a different risk score in conjunction with how much you drink. For example, if you don't flush and you drink heavily, your risk score is six. But if you flush, and drink the same amount of alcohol, your risk score is much higher, will be 10. Also, same goes for smoking. If you smoke, compared to no smoke, you will have risk score of two versus zero. And in this way, they have a risk assessment. Um, if you score more than nine or 10, esophageal and endoscope screening is recommended. So in this way, the, this model has been tested out in Japan they were able to capture one to 2% of all participants with early stage of esophageal cancer. Extrapolating this data, they believe that in Japan, if they adopt this model, they can actually capture 60% of all esophageal cancer. These cancers previously will not be detected. In other words, you can really catch this type of cancer in a very early stage. And so I think this is going to be very helpful. So we are adopting the Japanese model in Taiwan. We are also starting pilot study in three different hospitals. We will include the risk factor, as I mentioned, ABCD, the b use, and smoking, alcohol flushing, and alcohol consumption data, and assign them with risk scores. And so one of the tools that we need actually is really, we need to genotype ALDS2 now. And ALDS2 genotyping is actually very doable. It's very simple. There are actually commercial companies provide this service. You can pay, but the price usually is not so cheap. You can send to different companies. But 
on the other hand, there's actually now available non-invasive methods for quickly genotyping ALDH2. It is non-invasive. You can just use saliva and the quantitative PCR, real-time PCR. Within one hour, you can actually determine the ALDH2 genotype. So we think now the tools is really available, and this is actually what we are using now in Taiwan. It's really a community-based, large-scale genetic test for ALDH2. We are actually also including ADH1V genotype in this study and also the questionnaire. So we hope that with this method, it will be more successful in Taiwan. And lastly, I'd like just to spend a few minutes to mention not only the screening genotyping, it's important, but education awareness, it's also very important. And so we are also very actively promoting alcohol intolerance awareness and public health education in Taiwan. The reason is that I noticed that in the East Asian countries, alcohol intolerance is still not very well known. People know that they have this phenomenon, but they really don't know what causes it or the health implication of alcohol flushing. And so this is really a lot of education need to be done. If you ask most of the East Asian people about alcohol flushing, a majority of them still believe alcohol flushing is actually a good sign. For some reason, they believe that it's a sign of better liver function because they metabolize alcohol faster. It's a good sign of health. And a lot of East Asian people now, they adopt moderate drinking from the guideline published in the U.S. Regardless of alcohol flushing, alcohol intolerance, they still drink moderate amount of alcohol every day. I have many friends told me that they drink red wine every day because they thought that it's cardioprotective or can protect against a stroke. But we know that it's no longer true. So we need to educate these people. Lastly, the drinking culture also is very different in East Asia. There's actually a very high social pressure of encouraging drinking, or sometimes it's embarrassing not to drink. And so there's a lot of drinking culture needs to be done to change this, especially now such a high percentage of the people have alcohol intolerance. And so one thing we are doing now, it's I actually started a nonprofit organization in Taiwan called the Taiwan Alcohol Intolerance Education Society. Here, uh, this website, if you are interested, you can visit the website. The society mainly is just to devote education, to tell people, about alcohol intolerance and to explain to them what is alcohol tolerance and then the danger of alcohol drinking. And so we really like to reduce harmful drinking in these countries and to tell people not to drink. So we are very actively educating people about alcohol intolerance. The other thing we have been doing since three years ago is to promote Taiwan No Alcohol Day as a national educational alcohol awareness day. And it's designated the May 9th will be the no alcohol day because May 9th in Chinese it's no alcohol. And so it's very easy for people to remember that May 9th means no alcohol. And so this movement has been quite successful in Taiwan. And this year we have more than a hundred major organizations actually endorse this national Taiwan no alcohol day. I know that WHO has been trying to this more than 20 years ago, but has not been very successful. However, in Taiwan, this has been very, very successful over the last three years. Now, even the government is endorsing this awareness day. And so for five, nine, May 9th every day, this will be no alcohol day. And I hope this will be a model that can be used in different countries in East Asia, for example, in countries like China or Japan or Korea. And not only that, there's actually a very quick way that uh, it's very easy to tell people to test if they have alcohol intolerance uh, very easily. That is what we call the alcohol patch test. It's a Band-Aid test. Basically, you use a strong alcohol, just wet a piece of Band-Aid and contact your screen for about 10, 20 minutes. After that, you peel it off. If you see a red spot, most likely you have ALDH2 deficiency. That means that you are alcohol intolerance. This is the method adopted by a paper published in 1987 by Dr. Higuchi. And this method is pretty good a surrogate way to test whether you are ALDH2 deficient or not. It's about 70% accurate. And so this is very easy DIY actually for a genetic test. And this is very popular in Taiwan. Now many schools actually use this for education. 
And in Taiwan, we are also working together with government to publish all sorts of educational material, as you can see mostly in Chinese, but we use actually heavily the social media to talk about alcohol intolerance in Taiwan, especially this year. We use a YouTube influencer in Taiwan, make the interview with a doctor to talk about the physiological response, the danger of alcohol drinking and alcohol intolerance. And it's been, I think, watched by more than half a million people in a short two weeks. And this is also heavily reported in the news media. And so I think Taiwan is very successful in educating people about alcohol intolerance. And as I mentioned that, I hope this can be a good model to educate the 560 million people or people who are not even East Asians, but suffer alcohol intolerance. And lastly, I just want to end my talk with these two messages. Here on the left, there's no safe limit of alcohol drinking. That should be, I think, the new guideline for everybody to know, even in the LA Times that this feature of alcohol glow or alcohol intolerance is also reported. And it's not really embarrassing, it's just the way we are, we carry this mutation. In Taiwan, we are now encouraging people do not drink if you have not started drinking, especially if you have alcohol intolerance, you should really avoid alcohol drinking. And so this is the message I'd like to give you. I hope this is helpful. And I would just like to acknowledge my lab. We do a lot of research on ALDH2 mutation, its enzyme function, and the disease association. I'd like to especially give my thanks to my PI, Professor Daria Moshe Wilson. This is our lab, and also our research is funded by NIH. And I also like to acknowledge Dr. Eric Gross, our collaborator at Stanford, also very actively promoting alcohol intolerance with us. And lastly, the Taiwan Alcohol Intolerance Education Society and my friends in Taiwan. So thank you very much.